The opening ceremony was quite unusual in theatrical terms, in that each of the artistic segments had their own creative directors, choreographers and costume designers. So this impacted our work with the volume of information we had to absorb and the number of meetings that we had to attend. Parallel to this, we had to be attentive to the closing ceremony creative process to ensure that we knew exactly what to expect in the two short weeks that we had to create that event. And yet another, with yet another director, after the opening ceremony, was history. Each of the artistic segments was very different in terms of style and content. So the first step was to sit down with executive producer Marco Balic and establish the overall geography of the lighting journey that we will be making throughout the evening. We decided on two main complementary colours for each sequence to delineate between the differing scenes and to create continuity for the multiple camera coverage so that each segment had a, recogni a recognisable look from wherever in the stadium it was viewed. It's important to me in multi-camera shots that when the TV director cuts from one shot to another, the audience has a clear understanding of what is happening and where they are viewing it from. If we light everything in multiple colours, each shot can look so different that in the extreme, the coverage looks as though it's coming from different venues. A bichromatic approach helps this understanding of where and what we are viewing and has an important role for lighting on this style of the event, on this style of event. This simple approach is also represented in our grouping and focusing of the lights. By being minimalistic with our groups of lights, we retain control of the lighting system and, and the clarity of the scenes that we produce. Whereas in, in theatre or the studio, each channel might be one or two kilowatts. In this environment, each channel is at least 20 or 30 kilowatts, but the principles remain the same. The footlights for the Sapario curtain, for example, hidden behind these little boxes, were one channel of 16 5 kilowatt Molfe floods, creating an effect that we could achieve with two 2 kilowatt Fresnels as tab warmers in a theatre environment. One of the other tricks we employ to help us with the scale of the installation is attention to detail of the physical rigging and orientation of the lights to reduce focusing time. The house lights in the roof were a good example. We were able to focus one truss of six lamps and then copy the pan and tilt parameters to the other 39 trusses. A little touching up and bingo, 240 lights were focused in 30 minutes as each truss was in correct alignment to its given section of stand. Weather was an important factor, and we encountered rain, snow and hail each night. The stage had to be covered with plastic sheeting, which then got wet and froze, creating an interesting surface on which to skate to work, much like the streets of England at the moment. Once the focusing was complete, we then created our colour, pa colour palette for the show, matching each of the unique dichroic colour systems in the disparate lamps to each other, and desaturating some of the deeper colours for the electronic eye. <coughs> Many of the, the segment directors had no TV or stadium experience, and we spent many a constructive hour explaining to them that one actor in 20 follow spots against a Congo blue background, although looking lovely in real life, would not make for good TV. However, I was able to persuade them to take some risks with colour, and compared to other Olympics, it was noted how our theatrical use of colour worked well on the TV screen. Obviously we could only work at night, and as most of the thousand strong cast were volunteers available for rehearsing mainly during the day, the actual lighting sessions were a real challenge, working as we were most of the time with no actors and no set. Many of the set elements, such as the Sapario and the moving ring structure, required fair weather and teams of technicians to operate, so were not available to us overnight. Working only in the dark, saw the advantage of my missing the endless stream of production meetings, but the disadvantages were that the various directors would use their rehearsal time in daylight to improve their sections. It was quite frustrating to work on one piece overnight, only to find that it had been completely changed the next day and we had to relight it. We actually lit the first five minute sequence of our two and a half hour opening ceremony three times over the first three nights of programming, which was not an auspicious start. The protocol elements of speeches, flag raising and the all-important Olympic torch lighting were comparatively under-rehearsed. And though limited numbers of stand-ins gave us some clue as to what we would see on the night, this really was an exercise in intuitive lighting program programming, as we never saw a single scene 
with all its performance set and special effects components. As ever with large-scale events, the lighting designer's role involves a massive amount of politics, trying to keep producers, directors and artists' egos in line with the realities of production schedules and the technical boundaries in which we worked. I would say that 80% of my time in Turin was spent on politics and 20% on actual lighting design. The show went ahead flawlessly and the spirit that the Italian creators had shown in their meetings really was reflected in the passion of a very moving historical event. The lighting was very well received and applauded for its theatricality and colour and I became the first British lighting designer to have lit an Olympic ceremony event. Two weeks later we performed the closing ceremony, highlighted for me by blind tenor Andrea Bocelli and 500 young women in bridal gowns carrying illuminated lilies. And finally we illuminated the opening ceremony of the Paralympics. Although this event was not covered by anywhere near as many countries than the previous ceremonies, it proved to be one of the most, evening, one of the most moving evenings that I noticed, that I witnessed. The show combined the sporting challenges of Olympic events with the personal challenges of the athletes taking part. For me, this most clearly demonstrated the nature of the Olympic spirit. I have been most fortunate in having been invited to light some fantastic events over the years, not least of which was my invitation to light the 2012 handover to London during the closing ceremonies of the Olympics and Paralympics Games in Beijing. My task here was to illuminate the eight-minute handover sequence which formed part of the closing ceremonies using the stadium lighting rig designed by my Chinese colleague, Mr. Xiao Zhao Lin. Sorry, Xia Zhao Lin. The system available to me consisted of some 2,500 Martin, Clay Packy and Verilite moving heads and 24 follow spots. In order to circumnavigate the inevitable politics of staging our London event on Chinese territory, I travelled to Beijing during the year before the ceremonies to form a relationship with the Chinese lighting team and to offer my advice from experience on Olympic events and lighting for HDTV. I was able to introduce some Western expertise to the Chinese lighting team and Paul Collison and Dennis Garden, Gardner were employed as system consultants for lighting and video respectively. Their presence was really useful when we needed to get information such as scripts and lighting drawings which the Chinese kept very close to their chests. This picture of myself and Mr. Shah demonstrates the art of allowing our host to save face by inviting him to stand one step up for the photo. He, was <laughs> he proved to be a great friend and a very talented lighting designer, as those of us who witnessed the opening and closing ceremonies will most surely agree. Although we had established a good working relationship with the lighting department, the rest of the UK production team suffered from lack of information and the time necessary to work to the professional level to which they aspired and to which they were accustomed. The Chinese wanted to keep everything as confidential as possible, which one could understand, but dovetailing our show into theirs obviously relied on a certain level of knowledge as to what they were up to. We were given a two-hour lighting session in which to create our cues, and I prepared a minimal list of eight cues and a series of renderings of the different looks in WYSIWYG to give them an idea of what we were after. I also created a comprehensive list of follow spot cues and plans of which spot picked up what and where and when. Although the three operators and spot caller did not speak any English, another Chinese colleague who, had met, who I had met whilst lecturing in China about my Turin experiences was Mr. Shah's assistant and yet another route into their world. The object was to illuminate the London bus as it travelled around the stadium, dramatise the transformation of the bus and ensure that the images of the stars performing in our sequence were shown in the best light to the world's TV audiences and press. It's often unrecognised that as lighting di designers we are the directors of photography, not only for billions of TV viewers, but for every image seen in newspapers or on the web around the globe. Therefore it pays to get the lighting of the money right at least. The next challenge we were presented with is unique to stadium work and, a poss and is possibly the most difficult situation in, a in which a lighting designer can find themselves. After the inevitable changes to our show in rehearsals, which were being held at the only private airfield in China, which was closed as no one was allowed to overfly Beijing during the Olympics, we requested a return to the stadium to update the lighting programme. 
We were invited to the stadium at 11 p.m. on Saturday before the closing ceremony and given one hour to work with the programmers. Unfortunately, they were preparing the pitch for a soccer final and we were not allowed to turn out the stadium lighting. This became an exercise in intuitive lighting design, as if you took control of all 2,500 moving lights and moved the fader up and down, there was no visible effect on the pitch. In the end, we had done as much homework as possible and tried to realise our aspirations with humility and wit. And although the dress rehearsal was rained off, I felt quite confident as I arrived on the night to call the show. During the video clip before our sequence, I said very clearly to my Chinese friends through my English-speaking colleague, standby Q1. Q1 was promptly executed and I gave no more standbys. The bus had a system of LED fittings supplied by IPIX and these were programmed by Tim Routledge, who operated from the bus throughout the show. We also had an array of LED umbrellas which were deployed at the end of the sequence and the control system for these presented Tim with an interesting challenge. The onboard PCs were running quite badly on Windows Vista and needed to be replaced with a clean version of Windows XP. It was impossible to buy an original software like this at any level of merchandise outlet in China. Government, street, anywhere, you could not find an original copy of Windows. Luckily, the London IT guys had brought a copy over from the UK. The show was very well received by my client and attracted a great deal of interest, mostly positive, in the UK press. We then had a week's rest and returned to prepare the London bus part two for the Paralympics. This was the first time that the handover ceremonies of the Olympics and the Paralympics had shared a theme. The idea being that the bus transformed back into its new Paralympic livery and set off on the journey home to London. Again, we negotiated one and a half hours programming time to make a few alterations to the original lighting states and arrived with more prints of cue lists and our pictures of the spot cues required for our final show. Unfortunately, the Chinese programmers had tidied up their desks and wiped all our previous cues. I started at 10.30 to recreate everything from scratch before our midnight deadline when they were to dress rehearse their own ceremony.